last hearing team from IBM. What you're about to watch is what we would like to call the alumni talks. I hear you guys thinking, what are the alumni talks? Uh, basically it's going to be a series of videos in which we interview different IBM alumni. Uh, so you can think of people that work at an NGO right now, or at a corporate, or in a consultancy. Uh, basically to prepare yourself in finding that right career. Yeah, so in this video we will be uh, interviewing Sikko. He has been a headhunter for over 30 years now. And we will be asking him questions regarding the graduate dilemma. And these questions will give you guys more insights in kickstarting your career. And he will give us some advice on how we can best do that. So have fun watching and uh, stay tuned. Enjoy! <laughs> So Siko, can I ask uh, you, what, what do you do? Where did you work? And can you maybe tell us a bit more about this uh, dilemma? My view is that uh, when I joined the labor market uh, some 40 years ago, the situation was different than today. You have far more choices. There is the difference in generation characteristics. Yeah. There are different views on career patterns. Um, and let's not forget the increasing uh, Peer pressure and pressure from parents plays a big role. Um, and the society is changing with uh, different views on uh, careers and, um, and therefore, let's say, a lot more options for yourself to decide upon, which seems to be good. But of course, too many options also makes it very difficult. And I've learned over the last couple of years that many of you struggle with the direction where to go. And even worse, when you meet recruiters, the first thing they ask you, what do you want? And how can you, if you don't know yourself well enough in relation to the labor market? And secondly, you have no clue what the world out there looks like. So that is the reason I developed the graduate uh, <coughs> dilemma program. So how do you look upon this statement, yes. a dilemma? I think that both of us agree and we recognize this as being a problem because of course uh, not far from now we need to start working and we really have no idea uh, what's waiting uh, for us out there because there's a lot of options and sometimes it's hard to figure out where do I fit. So um, yeah that's why we are really curious what would you advise us to do where can we best start? Uh, in the whole process there is a missing link. You jump straight from yourself into the labor market by how do I write my CV? How do I need to interview? Is there an internship? And more important, you look at each other and you say, what do you do? Oh, is Unilever on your list? Not on mine. I put a Unilever on my list. Um, and my view is that there is a missing piece. And the missing piece is uh, not only who you are, because quite often you've done a number of tests and you know reasonably well who you are, but in relation to the labor market, um, any idea what's out there? Another thing is um, in relation, why, why in the heck do you want to work? Uh, uh, so maybe to turn it around, why do you want to work? Uh, is that for your environment who expects you to do so? Is that because you want status or power? Is it because you want to be part of an organization? Do you want to make money? What is the reason you want to start working? Do you have an idea? Yes, well, I think I really like to start working also to continue to develop myself. So on a professional level and a personal level, I'm really looking for, uh, I think, a company that can help me to continuously develop myself. So I think that that's what I want to get from a job. That's no surprise because uh, from uh, let's say all the 500 students uh, I've dealt with over the last couple of years, uh, it's very consistent that the most important reason for you to start working, apart from earning a living, eh, which is more or less, uh, yeah, you, you need to be able to eat and to feed yourself, is to develop yourself. So I know you have a number of questions, but let's keep this focus on personal development in mind when I'm trying to answer your questions. So. Fire away, <laughs> whatever question you may have. <laughs> we have a lot of questions, uh, so that won't be a problem. Uh, maybe a first relevant question, because of course there are a lot of careers and opportunities and companies out there. Uh, and to illus illustrate this uh, dilemma, 
uh, for example, I'm doubting uh, between a Schiphol Airport and an Accenture, a consultancy firm. Could you maybe elaborate uh, what's, what's the difference among those companies and where should I work? And if I have a certain profile, which, well, where, yeah, where, which way should I go? Let's try if we can, let's say, characterize the two organizations. Uh, Schiphol, uh, I can imagine that maybe you, you, there could be different reasons why you, you would be in for Schiphol. One could be the relevance for society, eh, like the Dutch railways or uh, Schiphol is one of them, which is an interesting uh, activity. Uh, the second thing is that you like uh, the airline industry and that everything that goes with it. The third thing could be uh, that you're not opting for a big multinationals, but for a medium-sized company. Uh, so what is Schiphol? We know what they do. They're medium-sized because they're not that big. Uh, they're state-owned, uh, which is important to realize. And then you have on the other side, you have Accenture, a worldwide consulting firm. Used to be a true partnership that's slightly different now, but they're big, they're international. And your role at Accenture will be a consultant. Hmm. Your role at Schiphol Airport can vary. You can do commercial roles, you can do operational roles, you can do finance roles. And what you will see at Schiphol, what you learn is that because you do different roles, you will better find out for yourself, uh, am I more managerial, am I more specialist, am I more commercial, am I more... And different roles will hope so, over time will give you more responsibility as well. Um, Accenture, of course, there you are consulted, most likely in a specific area. And what do you learn there? You learn the specifics of that consulting role. A big plus of Accenture, of course, is that you see many, many different companies around the world. So it broadens your view. If you might decide later on to leave Accenture to do something else, after that, you will have a far better view what's out there. But you, you remain an advisor. Whilst at Schiphol, you could do, let's say, advisory roles, but you could also do more managerial roles. Generally speaking, uh, you could expect uh, in a top-notch consulting form, what do you learn apart from, let's say, suppose you are specialized in sustainability, then you learn sustainability but you learn something else. At big consulting firms, you learn analytical skills, how to simplify big issues, problems, etc. And the second thing, which I think is extremely important is what I would call professional rigor. Mm. At professional rigor, I come to that in a minute later to explain with a few examples what I mean, but it has to do with delivering what you should deliver beyond what is expected, knowing where the bar is and things like that. That is, better developed in a top-notch consulting firm than, for instance, at Schiphol. At Schiphol Airport, also because they're partly government-owned, let's say the professional rigor is less strict than in a consulting firm. The advantage, of course, of Schiphol is also that you learn something about what Schiphol does, the different things regarding airlines, so you build a knowledge and skills in that area. But they're two totally different things. I really like the financial services, so the banking companies, for instance, but I also have a passion for SOS children villages. And now I'm a bit curious, what shall I do? Where can I best start? Because these firms are so different from each other. What can I learn at what firm and what's the best to start at maybe? A good way of looking at this is uh, that we, no, first of all, is the question, do you want to work at SOS children villages because you are passionate to help them or because it makes you feel good. And most likely it will be a combination of the two, I guess. Yes. Um, and, and the best way to illustrate it, and up front, I want to say there is no right or wrong, but it gives you an idea. Let's suppose I can clone you and one starts working at SOS Children Villages and the other one starts working at ABN Amro. And in five years from now, a new role vacancy comes up at SOS Children Villages and the two apply with the one with the background within and the other with the bank. And now you are in the jury to hire. 
who of the two would you hire? Hmm. Good question. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, I think that's mostly based on uh, the experience somebody's got, right? Especially in the start of somebody's uh, career. That's true. Like, there is, again, there is no right or wrong. The only point I want to make is that your professional development at ABN AMRO will be better than your development at SR Children Villages. And the question is, will that outweigh, let's say, the lack of knowledge uh, you have on SR uh, Children Villages? Both hirings are okay, but you hire different people. And my key message would be, I fully understand that all of you need something with a purpose these days, but you can't always fulfill everything at the same time. And maybe, uh, unless you are totally, totally passionate, start somewhere else and add more value later on to an organization like that. A totally different question then, uh, because for most of my friends and fellow students, uh, especially for the most ambitious one of them, uh, they have the desire to become, for example, the CEO of Philips. How, sh how should I become the CEO of such a big company? As long as your aim to become the CEO can be translated in your objective to get the best out of your abilities, then this star on the horizon as such is fine. When it becomes a dogma that you really want to become a CEO, I'm against it. Because in the first couple of years when you start working, you really don't know where your true strength is. And you can divide it basically in, 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 uh, and make a differentiation between, are you a more specialist, i.e. someone where your personal impact impacts the environment, or are you more a generalist where via other people who have the direct impact, and that is, something you don't know in advance even not during your student time when you've done all kinds of things in your fraternities etc once you start working it takes you 10 years before you realize are you more a sort of specialist or are you more a generalist because quite often it's not what it's called but it's what it is and let me give you one quick example i talked to a mother of a son and we and she said well my son has done something very unusual he switched from being a lawyer to a garden architect and i told her he's doing exactly the same because the characteristics of a lawyer and the characteristics of a garden architect are the same only it's a different activity but this personal impact the lawyer has personal impact the garden architect has personal impact so coming back to your ceo question as a as a star on the horizon it's fine but don't make it too dogmatic in that it should be because maybe you're suited, better suited for other roles. And if you're too dogmatic, it could be a disappointment and it shouldn't. I see, interesting. Do we have uh, another question for example? Uh, well, yes I have, um, because I also love the consumer industry. Um, and then my question is, if I want to start working, is it then maybe better to start at Tony Chocolonis or a, a big company like Nestle? Up front, uh, there is no right or wrong, but uh, there are different learnings in, for the different choices. Of course, Tony Chocoloni uh, appeals to people like you, I guess, because it's smaller, it's informal, it has a purpose. Uh, so that's a nice environment to be in. Yeah. <laughs> because Nestle quite often, most likely, will be seen as professional, big, uh, a bit bureaucratic. Uh, a good way to develop yourself but uh, in the beginning a very small piece of the jigsaw with little responsibility and both is true yes in the nest days of this world if you look at for instance the quality of learning marketing you probably learn that better at nestle than at tony chocoloni but on the other end at tony chocoloni you probably get more responsibility you do so different things it's a smaller organization um, and probably more fun to work so i come to a little bit later come to different learnings come to different learnings 
And these are different learnings. One is a learning that you become professionally better, Nestle. And the other one is a learning that is more trial and error and making now and then mistakes and see the results of that. And that's an equally important learning. Finally, of course, Bristoni show Colony, uh, um, it might be difficult over time to every time find a new job because of the size of the organization. So it could be that at some point in time, you need to switch, which is not a problem, but you have to realize that up front, whilst Nestle can offer more opportunities. So I, if I can summarize it, uh, depending on what you want to learn, you can choose for a certain company. Interesting. I think the yeah. next question relates a bit to that. Uh, because me personally, for example, I want to work at a corporate, uh, maybe a big tech company like uh, Google or uh, a Dutch corporate such as Shell. How should I make the decision between those companies? Interesting is that you mentioned Shell because 30 years ago, Shell was on the top of the list of every student. Hmm. Shell was almost number one. Now Shell is out because oil and gas is out. Um, and quite often, that's why Shell is dismissed. And I don't agree for two reasons. One is that Shell is still an excellent uh, platform for development because they're really, really good at it. That's one. And secondly, isn't it interesting to make, to be part of the transition switch, uh, what they are, they are going through as well. So instead of dismissing it, why not embrace it and do something good for society in that respect with a very good learning platform. Google, also big, also international, totally different. The Googles of this world, the Ubers of this world, the Atiens of this world, they're all organized chaos because they've grown, they've grown so fast that every time there was a new opportunity because the company grew and not because there was a well-planned management development system behind it, no way. I know a guy who joined Atyen, he studied psychology, and he talked to Atyen, he had nothing with payment systems. Um, and why did he join? He liked the atmosphere, he liked the entrepreneurial thing, the international aspect of it, and he went for it. And after two years, he thought, ah, I want to do something else. There was no HR. He just had to figure out by himself what his next job could be. So yes, both have an learning and developing aspect shell structured organized google unstructured unorganized but equally equally good as as a learning and the plus i would say in google is that you're in the midst of what the disruptive technology company is all about and that's of course important for the future as well okay interesting hmm. all right um, and to, to, to dwell on that, um, maybe it's good to, to take uh, a minute or two to decide on what do you learn in your working life? Uh, and as the slide shows, working life can be divided in three. One is filling your toolkit. The second one is building the house. And the third one is living in the house that suits you. Um, and I won't dwell too much on the second and third phase because that's beyond your horizon still, I would guess. Um, but in the first phase, filling and applying the toolkit, it's important because you learn a number of things. One is knowledge, you learn skills. Um, but most importantly, what you learn during your whole life and what also will be the differentiating factor is the behavioral side. Not the knowledge, not the skills. You need to do them because you need them. But the difference will be made by the behavioral side. And that has to do how effective are you with others. Uh, very important. But also a few basic things, what I would call the personal rigor. Uh, and with students, it's not always there. Um, and I don't mind. But once you start working, the personal rigor is extremely important. That's why... Uh, the Ten Commandments, and they are as simple as they can be. Uh, you don't need to be intelligent for that. For some, it's more natural than others, but you can all learn it. And I bet you, if you do things like being responsive, being on time, delivering what you should deliver, understanding what drives the other side of the table, etc., 
If you do it, you are 30% underway in achieving the goals you want to achieve. It's extremely important, and I would urge you to stick to it. And the more professional the firms and the organizations are, the better you learn professional rigor. The less professional they are, the less you learn professional rigor. Uh, and that's something you have to keep in mind. Uh, because in a smaller outfit, you learn entrepreneurship, for instance. You learn try and error. The professional rigor is less developed there versus a McKinsey or an Accenture. That's what. So keep that in mind. And those 10 commandments, put them under your pillow and leave them there for the rest of your life. <laughs> but once we're in a company, what sort of role should we be aiming for? Should we go for a marketing role, an HR role, sales, operations? Because there's so much to choose from. All roles have different characteristics. Uh, and you mentioned HR, for instance, um, but you could also think of marketing, sales, uh, operations. And again, there you learn, in all these different roles, you learn different things. Uh, for instance, in HR, you will learn the HR profession and you'll probably learn uh, without being in charge of something to be effective with others because you all have to do it on an equal basis, basically. Marketing is relatively easy because it's in line with your study, because it has something to do with the mind, with data, analytical thinking, etc. So you learn marketing, but from a behavioral point of view, you learn more from sales. Although these days, sales is also more data-driven than it used to be. But selling something, and whether it's in consumer environment or a B2B environment, is totally different. Uh, I know someone extremely well uh, uh, who has done her um, marketing uh, at Procter & Gamble. Um, and she is now in the choice between sales and marketing. And she realizes that sales would be very beneficial for her because it will broaden her skill sets. Uh, she really is more keen on following the marketing track and becoming very good at it, which is more than okay. But then you have to realize that that's what you're going to do. And let's say, and you, you leave a little thing on the table regarding your development. On the operational side, for instance, uh, take our hold when you, suppose you're doing management traineeship there, there they have always one traineeship for a year is in line with your study. It could be marketing, finance, or HR. And the other year is assistant store manager in a store somewhere in the Netherlands. You don't need to be intelligent there. How, but how do you make sure that the shelf fillers do their job? How do you make sure that the cashiers do what they should do? How do you make sure? That's something different. And that's an extremely good learning. So. Yes, different roles, again, different learnings. Hmm. And uh, Siko, if I can ask you this. Uh, yesterday, I was scrolling to, uh, to the internet uh, because I'm about to graduate and I have no clue where uh, I want to work. Uh, and when I was scrolling, I came on the page with the most prestigious companies. Uh, and of course, on number one, there was a McKinsey. Uh, but also when I googled, I found uh, first, consult, uh, first Consulting, which is a bit less prestigious. For, of which of these companies should I choose? What, what's the difference? Could you maybe tell us a bit uh, more about that? If you compare the two and you take the element of professional rigor again, more prestigious, generally speaking, is better than less prestigious in professional rigor's point of view. Um, Quite often, more prestigious are also bigger. Uh, so the sort of, the type of assignments you are working on will be more complex, uh, more international, uh, more diverse than, for instance, with first consulting. But in all fairness, when you start at McKinsey, it's PowerPoint, Excel sheets, Excel sheets, etc. So you do a very little piece of that whole process. And only when you grow, you are start to do more. If you go to first consulting, then you are allowed to do a lot more and you are more involved in assignments, also in getting assignments, etc. So again, more responsibility, more try and error, most likely very pleasant 
informal environment, whereas McKinsey is also pleasant, but stricter and tougher. Um, and again, that's, there is no right or wrong, uh, but there's a difference in what you learn. Uh, and that's with all the choices you make, you have to have a trade-off between what do I like and what do I learn. For instance, I'd like to work in an informal environment. So how can I find out if a company has an informal environment? Yeah, that's uh, the first question is, of course, why do you want to work in an informal environment? Well, I think it's also because uh, I might have more freedom to make mistakes, maybe, and more freedom to speak up for myself and just being able to get a, a proper learning process. Yeah, that's true, because in more informal environments, of course, you are quite often allowed to do more things and do different things. Um, with the plus that it gives you more responsibility uh, and also uh, quite often uh, the possibility to make mistakes which are not uh, decremental uh, to your career. Um, well, <coughs> um, but an important question also is, uh, do you want it now or do you want it later on? Because I can imagine that ideally we all want to work in an environment where we like the people, where we like the culture, where we like the purpose, uh, where we like the professionalism, etc. It will be very difficult to catch that all in one go in your first job. Uh, so sometimes it may, it's, it could be better uh, to invest in a more informal but very professional structured environment and later on make the move versus doing it straight away. But again, for some people is that informal environment so important that they don't want to go to the formal one and also then the choice is right as long as you make, as long as you realize why you made the choice. Um, and then the answer to your question, there is only one way to find out. And that is not to look at the websites. That is not to uh, visit career days and talk to uh, the people who are selling the company. The only way to find out is talk to people who work there or worked there. And then you should aim at people with five to 10 years working experience. Okay. Because if they're only one or two, they don't oversee the total picture yet. And if they all, the, if, when it's more than 10 years, they're, you don't relate to them anymore. Let's put it that way. Uh, maybe a bit regarding that coffee, but uh, for example, I like to work with a tacit product. So a product that I can see, uh, that I can hold in my hands. Uh, yeah. And I think that is a bit related to the next question. Uh, because for example, one, when I want to work at, a, at an action, uh, a shop that we all uh, all know. Uh, and for example, uh, Bavaria, the beer that uh, I like to drink on the, on the Friday afternoon. Uh, and of course, Action is private equity owned and Bavaria uh, is of course uh, family owned. What, what's the difference between those types of uh, ownership? Uh, here, I think uh, uh, it's quite right to take the ownership angle because ownership also plays a role in uh, the level of platform for your personal development. Okay. Private equity sometimes has a positive connotation and sometimes a negative or, or connotation. Uh, some people say, I will never want to work for private equity. Others do want to work for private equity, also for the financial upside. But if you take that out for a minute, one thing you cannot deny is that private equity is extremely sharp regarding getting the results. Uh, if, you, if you consider the way they look at cash, the way they look at working capital, etc., a lot of other companies listed, family owned, etc., can learn a lot from private equity. They're extremely good at that. So it could well be that for a number of years, this is a very, let's say, uh, useful experience, although they're tough, uh, they're very demanding, uh, and maybe not always that nice. Whilst the family, Bavaria family, <laughs> uh, family is a family owned company. It's a joy to work there because it's a pleasant atmosphere. The products 
does something as well, eh? because beer, they all like it, and it's, a, and it's an extremely nice environment to work in. Most likely, because they have a longer term view on the results, they're less demanding. And maybe also from a professional point of view, they accept certain things from people because they're all part of the family. So from an environment point of view, it's very pleasant to environment, and both, plus the fact that it's so big that the level of people is more than okay uh, in that respect. But private equity is tougher. Uh, so the big difference is where is the bar and how do you get there? Once we start working, um, how do we know when we can uh, develop ourselves? There are five, let's say, elements how you learn. One is you learn from an environment, and that has to do with the professionalism of the organization, the people who work there, the structure. That's one. You learn from an environment by observing it and being part of it. The second one is everything that has to do with education, courses, you name it. The third one is you learn from people and people can be an entrepreneur, can be a craftsman, can be a manager, uh, a leader, you learn from. The fourth one is just do it, learning on the job. You, you start doing it and you come across everything you come across. And the final one is related to the fourth one is that is try and error. You do things, you make mistakes, you fall and you get up again. And these sort of learnings are not one-on-one -on, -one on organization, but there are some, uh, let's say, uh, guidelines you can take into can take can take take into account. Because if you look at the slides, um, the where with different angles, uh, that shows you that looking at organization companies is not from one angle. You can say. I look at the sector because I like consumer or I like services or I like financial services, but it's only one. The other ones we discussed is look at the size. It makes a difference. Look at the ownership. It makes a difference. Look at complexity, look at culture and look at purpose. All these different angles have different impact on the learning platform you're going to join. And the same applies to the different roles you're going to do. And then, of course, your key, key, key question will be, okay, there is the what, uh, there is the how, and there is the where. How do they relate to each other? And there are no strict rules, luckily, but some rules are the bigger the organization, the more professional the organization, the more you learn from a platform of environment. Luckily, uh, and also, the more structured companies are the best equipped regarding courses, education, etc. Tony Chocoloni, you will not find a, a very good program regarding uh, all kinds of courses you can do certain phases of your career. At Procter & Gamble, you can, for instance. Um, luckily, learning from people, which is the most important learning there is, if you ask any executive how they have learned, they will all say, that they learned from specific people. And not only because those people told them what to do, but by observing behavior. And good people, of course, you will find anywhere. At big companies, but there can also be good co people at small companies. But for instance, when you join a startup, my advice would be, of course, you have to look at the business model a bit, but whether you want to join, or, and you have to look whether the activity as such is appealing to you. But there's only one thing you should look at, at the people who are the founders, the quality of the people, because at the startup, you totally depend on that. If you join a big corporate, you still have the structure and the environment around you. At the startup, look at, look at the people. The smaller the environment, the more you learn regarding taking responsibility, daring to take decisions, uh, having impact, try and error because they allow you to do it because they don't have a big system that takes care of, the, of itself. So the smaller, the more freedom, the more entrepreneurship, the more responsibility. Most likely, less professional environment-wise. And that is basically how you should ideally judge uh, the different options that come across. So take a far broader look what's there, cross off what you don't want, Leave in what you might want, 
then take a dive into some different sectors. And let's say initially, um, the sector is the easiest one to go at. Uh, and once you have done that, then decide or try to decide whether you should go for a bigger organization, smaller organization, culture wise, etc. And once you have narrowed that down, then you're going to have cups of coffee with people who work there, but who are not in HR, who just are prepared to share their real views. Uh, because HR, quite rightly so, will tell the story uh, to sell the company. And once you've done that, yeah, then you can, let's say, decide to target which ones you really want to go for. And then you come into, how do I make my CV? How do I interview? How do I test, et cetera? You gave us a lot of advice for how we can prepare ourselves for making that right step or finding the right career. Uh, but maybe on a more general note, do you have some key takeaways for students that they uh, can live by in finding that right career? Um, one is this, uh, how to deal with the peer pressure. Uh, and that's something you have. To, I think it's good to realize that upfront, um, that is there and uh, that you have to deal with it. That's one. Uh, secondly, um, which is not easy for your generation because you're so used to figuring out everything via all the, via Google or internet, etc. You're used to finding all the information which is there. And now you are confronted with something you cannot find there because you have to experience it. So, uh, that's also why sometimes people do a second master's for very good reasons and sometimes it's postponing the decision. Um, consultancy, you could also ask, argue that it's partly also postponing the decision. And at some point in time, you can search again, you can search again, you can 10 cups of coffee, you have 20 cups of coffee, you have 30 cups of coffee. At some point in time, you have to jump and just do it. But now we come with the your generation characteristics. What if after two years, it doesn't work out? And in your book, it's a failure. And in my book, it's a learning. Because when it doesn't work out, those two years are not wasted. On the contrary, maybe those two years add more value than the two years when it's all going well. But of course, there the peer pressure comes into play because then you have to let the whole environment know that you're going to do something different and it didn't work out and you're afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. And it's definitely not wasted. And then uh, the other one is, uh, I know you all want to progress fast uh, and up, but if it's true that in the first 10 years of your working life, you fill your toolkit, it doesn't matter whether the hammer or the screwdriver goes in first, as long as the set is there when you are mid thirties. And some have more screwdrivers, some have more hammers. It really doesn't matter. As long as you make sure the more diverse your toolkit is, the better equipped you are. There's one contradiction. Not everyone recognizes uh, what's in the toolkit. So when you have worked for Unilever only, for instance, People real, know very well what's in there and you get a certain appreciation. If you've done three different jobs, one Unilever, one startup and one SOS Children Villages, some people say, well, three different jobs, uh, there's no line in the career and etc." My book is, that's a better toolkit than the Unilever toolkit, but not everyone will appreciate it. I have to tell you that. My strong belief is that everyone will end up where he or she should end up. So suppose I could take an MRE career scan of the two of you, and you will be plotted somewhere in that scan. At the end of the day, you will be pretty close to the plot. So therefore you don't need to worry a lot because it will follow. Because if you're not a CEO, you will maybe become a CEO but it will not be a success and you will follow a different route. And that's the route that suits you. The problem, especially with CEOs is that people are so, their ego plays a role that they really feel that that's the top of the pyramid. 
But if you're not happy, you're not equipped for it, you shouldn't strive for it. That's it. Because strive for your best personal development. Then you will end up where you should end up and where you're good at and happy with.